All right, Genesis 45, verse 5, the Bible reads, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. These are the words of uh, Joseph here. And you notice that uh, he's telling his brothers in this verse that it's God that sent him to Egypt. You know, this whole time we thought it was his brothers that sold him into Egypt, right? I mean, of course, his brothers did. But what you see here with Joseph is that he's able to acknowledge God. He's able to say, actually, it was God's purpose overall. You know, he was the one that allowed me to come here. He's the one that had a purpose for me in Egypt. And so he's able to acknowledge God. And that's the title for the sermon this morning, Acknowledge God. Genesis 45, Acknowledge God. We'll see uh, many times Joseph acknowledging God throughout this chapter. Let's start off with verse number 1, Genesis 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself. Now let's, uh, before we actually keep reading, remember, um, his brothers had returned. His brothers had returned back to Egypt and they brought Benjamin with him, right? They brought Benjamin back and so we pick up the story here. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him and he cried. This is what he, when he cries, this is something he, he says out, out loud. He says, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So Joseph commands he, the steward of his house, he commands the servants of his house, whoever it is that's in the house besides his brother to leave. He tells him to go and then he wants his purposes to make known himself to his brothers. Now he's going to finally reveal that this second is in, this com- uh, in command of Egypt is their brother, is Joseph himself. So he sends out the servants, verse number two, and he wept aloud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. So even though he tries to send these people out, he weeps so loud. They still hear what's going on. They still hear it, right? And he's weeping because he's finally, this burden, his pressure is coming off him. He's going to reveal the truth. And it says here, and the house of Pharaoh heard. So the news travels. They hear of Joseph weeping. They hear what Joseph is about to reveal. And this news gets, gets sent to Pharaoh. So even the house of Pharaoh hears what's going on. Verse number three, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. So um, I think obviously it says here that the brothers are troubled to see this revelation of Joseph. They're troubled. Obviously, they're shocked by this revelation. They're shocked. You know, they're not expecting this to be Joseph, that Joseph would rise to such power, such, such prominence in the land of Egypt. And of course, we know that happened because of the Lord. And perhaps they're a little bit troubled for their own welfare as well. You know, they have done evil toward Joseph. They could be wondering, hey, what, what's going to happen to us? What's he going to do to us? This is a man of power, a man of authority. And so they're troubled. And the other thing you'll notice by this troubled, it didn't fully process in their mind that this is Joseph, their brother right now. All right. He says, look, I am Joseph, right? Doth my father yet live? Look at verse number four. And Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, <laughs> right? I'm not some other Joseph, just in case they didn't process in their mind. He goes, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Not just your brother, the one that you sold. That's me, is what he's saying, right? He's saying to, he's realizing these guys just aren't processing the information. And so he gives them that further revelation. I'm your brother, not just some other Joseph. I'm the one that you sold into Egypt. Verse number five. Now, therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Wow. You know, we see the, the forgiving heart of Joseph there, right? He says, look, don't be upset. Don't be angry. Don't grieve. You know, don't go back to the remembrance that you've sold me into Egypt. You already saw in the previous chapters they had remorse. He already saw in the previous chapters that they were, they felt guilty about what they had done. And they felt that the, the evil that was being done upon them was a result of the wickedness that they did to their brother, uh, Joseph. And Joseph said, look, I don't want you to go back and remember those things anymore. Don't let it grieve you. God had a purpose for me. What an amazing thing, right? What an amazing thing to be sold by your family, to be betrayed by your brothers, to be taken away from your father's house and he's able to turn around and just forgive his brethren, you know, forgive his brethren. And my immediate thought when I think about this forgiveness in Joseph's part is the forgiveness of Christ. 
when he was being crucified on the cross in Luke 23. You don't need to turn there. Luke 20, 23, 33. It says, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his garments and cast lots. You see, Joseph was able to see the evil that was being done upon him, and he was able to just forgive those that did it, right? He was able to acknowledge this was God's plan all along. And we see that with Christ. When Christ is being crucified, yes, it was by the wicked hand of the Jews. Yes, it was by the ignorance of the Romans, you know, denying him a fair trial. Yes, they intended wickedness on Christ, but Christ was able to forgive those that were doing it, brethren. He was able to forgive them, because it was God's purpose all along. It was God's purpose that Christ would die on the cross. Hey, it was God's purpose that Joseph would go into Egypt. What was the purpose at the end of verse number five? God did send me before you to preserve life. He says, look, you sold me here. You meant harm, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And again, the, the, you know, Romans 8.28, which I spoke about last chapter. And we know that all things work together. For good to them that love God, to them which are called according to his purpose. Joseph could see the good. Joseph could see the hand of God. But brethren, sometimes it takes time. It takes time to see the hand of God. You could be going through those hardships, but brethren, just stay true to the Lord. Just remind yourself, whatever difficulty you're going through, God is allowing you to go through that trial. God is allowing you to go through that for good purposes, for your profit. Okay, remind yourself of these things, and it might take several years later. You know, for Joseph, this is like 20 years later almost, right? That he's, he's, he's come to realize God meant this for good. God, and he's able to receive. He's re able to receive it and forgive others. You know, one reason that we struggle to forgive other people is we don't focus on the good that's come out of the hardship we went through. We don't focus on what they, you know, we focus on what they've done against us rather than thinking about what did God mean for me to go through this situation, for me to go through this trouble. And, you know, we see this great uh, similarity there between Joseph and Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 6. For these two years have the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be erring nor harvest. Erring is basically just like plowing the ground, sowing seeds. He goes, look, there's another five years to go. You know, this is, our, this is the second year of the time of famine. We know the first year they had to go and get food. Then they've run out of food. They had to go again. I guess the second year they've gone out again. Just saying, look, it's just going to keep happening for another five years. All right? Verse number seven. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. What is that? Uh, when he says that uh, before you to preserve you a posterity. What is that? What's a posterity? That's basically your descendants, you know, your children, future generations. Joseph says, the reason I've been sent here to Egypt is to preserve future generations. Okay? Now, this is important because what is the great promise that we see in the book of Genesis? What is the great promise that God gives to Eve? Remember that she would have a seed that would bruise the head of the serpent? What about the promise that God gave to Abraham? That he would be a father of, 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 you know, that, that, that he would be a father of many nations, right? That all nations would be blessed because of him and his seed. Hey, that same promise was passed down to his son Isaac. And then it was passed down to, to Jacob, who became Israel. All right? And so what we see, even through the life of Joseph, is that God is still faithful to his promise. You know, that through these descendants, these physical descendants, we will receive that seed. That seed will be born that seed, of course, being Jesus Christ, who would save not just a physical seed here, but of course, Christ being the seed would save a spiritual seed, right? All of us can see salvation, even to the point here of, 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 uh, of uh, God sending Joseph to preserve these future generations, to preserve this seed. Listen, if God did not allow Joseph to go to Egypt, this, this life, this generation would have died out, and God would not fulfill that promise of Jesus Christ. And so we know that God has a plan, a big plan, you know, a big plan to bring Christ. And brethren, God has a plan for you. God has a plan. God has a vision for your life that you would serve him all the days of your life. And when you're going through those difficulties, just remind yourself 
God has a plan for me. God has a will for me to serve Him and just keep serving the Lord no matter what difficulties come. You know, just make sure you acknowledge God. That's what Joseph is able to do. Acknowledge God. Verse number 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither. It wasn't you, but God. And he have made me a father to Pharaoh. It's like father, I guess, you know, a position of high authority. Or maybe a father, you know, because he was also a counselor, as it were, to Pharaoh. Maybe that's what it's referring to. Authority or a counsel. And lord over all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So again, time will bring you to understand the past. You know, why did I suffer in the past? Why am I suffering today? It's going to take time. It took Joseph to the point where he had to be second in command over all the house of Pharaoh, over the house of Israel, to, oh, sorry, um, of Egypt, to finally realize God's come through. God had a plan. Just keep that at the forefront of your mind. Acknowledge God. Acknowledge God, whatever difficulties you're going through. Even if you're going through no difficulties. And if you're having a great life. If you're not going through problems, guess what? Acknowledge God. You know, just give God the honor. Just tell yourself that it's God that's allowed me. He's the one that's given me life. He's the one that's given me purpose. He's the one that's given me New Life Baptist Church. He's the one that's given me my husband or my wife or my children. He's the one that's given me what I have acknowledge God you know and you know a beautiful characteristic we see here in Joseph verse number nine haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him thus saith thy son Joseph God hath made me Lord of all Egypt come down unto me tarry not what's flowing out of the mouth of Joseph brethren God 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 right he acknowledges God verse number five he said God did send me. Verse number seven, he says, and God sent me. Verse number eight, and now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And verse number nine, God have made me Lord of all Egypt. Is Joseph boasting of himself? Is he full of pride? You know, what, his great accomplishment, his great position, is it from his efforts? He says, no, it's all of God. It's all of God. I can only thank God. And if you can please turn to, um, please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, please. Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 32, please turn there while you keep your finger in Genesis 45. And I'll just read a few verses to you. You know, a very famous one, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths does god want you to acknowledge him he does and if you if you get into the practice of acknowledging god no matter what you're going through he shall direct thy paths right trust in the lord with all thine heart but it's easier said than done okay because i know you know we have flesh and blood i know we have doubts i know we struggle when we go through hardships and we don't think that god is looking after us but god is seeing us through God is allowing us to go through whatever hardship, whatever trials, so He can profit us. He can direct our paths. The, the, the thing you need to develop in your lives, brethren, is just acknowledge God. Just, just give Him acknowledgement, whatever situation you find yourself in. You know, just find yourself able to do that. Acknowledge Him from your mouth. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 37 says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that are right unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Hey, not only are you to acknowledge God, but you're to acknowledge this book. You're to acknowledge the words of God, that these are the words of God. These are the commandments of the Lord, not just the writings of men. You know, God wants you to acknowledge this book. This is not some other book on your shelf. Okay, this is not a work of fiction. You know, this is, this is a work of, 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 of truth. This is what God has revealed unto us. This book is a miracle. There's no way you can get 40 different authors writing about religion, writing about faith, writing about eternity, writing about salvation, about sin, and yet be as consistent as this word is. This is an impossible work of God. We have to acknowledge the Bible as well in our lives, brethren. 
When you can appreciate your Bible, you can't help but pick it up. You can't help but read those verses. When you set aside the Bible, when you stop reading your Bible, you've stopped acknowledging the commandments of God in your life. God wants you to acknowledge Him. God wants you to acknowledge His commandments found in the Word of God. And one more verse before we go to Deuteronomy. Luke 12, 8. These are the words of Jesus. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. And if you acknowledge God in public, you acknowledge God to other people, that's preaching the gospel, amen. But just thanking God in public, He's going to acknowledge you. He's going to confess you before the angels of God. What a privilege, you know, for God to name, you know, Brother Tim. You know, he says, you know, Father, this is Tim who acknowledged me. You know, every time he got an opportunity to preach the gospel, he acknowledged my name. You know, every hardship, every trial he went through, he acknowledged God. He acknowledged me as his Savior, as his help in a hard time. Man, what an honor to be presented before God the Father and his angels by name, by Jesus Christ. And all you need to do is acknowledge him. That's all you need to do. Acknowledge him in this life. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, please. We're just going to read a portion of the Song of Moses. And this is a song that Moses sings shortly before he dies. And I want you to see Moses because Moses was a very successful man as well, wasn't he? He was a man of authority. He was a man who, uh, you know, God used to defeat Egypt so the, the Israelites would leave that land. But what does Moses do? Verse number one. He says, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. What's going to come out of his mouth? Man, I had such great victory. I was such a great leader. Is that what's going to come out of his mouth? He says, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Hey, who does Moses acknowledge? God, right? He publishes, he proclaims the name of the Lord. The great victory that Israel has had at the hand of Egypt. Moses does not proclaim his own name. He proclaims the name of the Lord. He acknowledges God for the greatness that he's done. Verse number four, he is the rock. His work is perfect. And not the work of Moses. The work of Moses is not perfect. You'll never be perfect, brethren. You'll never be 100% righteous. You're going to keep mistake, making mistakes for the rest of your life. So don't, don't rejoice in your, your work, right? He says his work, the work of God, here's my rock. His work is perfect. And uh, for all his ways of judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. A God without iniquity. You've got iniquity. God is just. You're not always just. And right is He. You're not always right. But God is always right. God is always just. God is always without iniquity. God is always truth. What a great proclamation from the mouth of Moses. And so we need to acknowledge good, uh, God. And listen, brethren, again, when you're going through those trials, when you're going through those problems, just say to yourself, he is just, what did Moses say? And right is he. It is right for God to allow me to go through this trial. It is just. I'm going to trust that God knows what he's doing. He's allowing me to go through this. It is right for me to go through this. Can you say that, brethren? That's where you need to get to in life. When you get through your trials, your difficulties, your tribulations, your hardships, whatever you struggle with, your pain. It is right for God to allow me to go through this. That's hard for me to say. I know it's hard for you to say. But this is where we need to be. This is where we need to grow in maturity, in our spiritual life. Grow and acknowledge God. Magnify the name of the Lord. Please go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Verse 1. A psalm of David. David, another great man, another great leader, another great man that God used to accomplish great things. What does it say in verse number 1, Psalm 34, verse 1? I will bless the Lord at all times. All times. His praise shall continually 
be in my mouth. Is that us, brethren? Do we bless the Lord at all times? Is His praise continually in your mouth? Now, brethren, you know, sometimes we have a bit of a chuckle, right? We brother, you know, brother, I brought up my brother Michael many times, right? But he, how many times does he acknowledge the Lord? Now, look, I'm sure he doesn't want me to acknowledge him for this, right? But it's true, right? No matter how hot it gets in this building, he's thanking God that it's not as hot as hell. Praise God, right? No matter how unreceptive the Sunshine Coast can be, he's thanking God that it's not as unreceptive as the Czech Republic. Thank Jesus, right? What a blessing. Hey, that's praising God continually with your mouth. That's what David was doing. He was blessing the Lord, right? Continually praising Him. Are you going to be continually in good spirits? No, there's going to be times when you're in bad spirits. There's going to be times when you're not doing well in life. But does that mean you stop praising God? Hey, this is why you come to church. Hey, there might come a time in your, in your life and you say, well, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I don't like the situation I'm in. I'm, I'm not happy with my life. I'm not happy with, with what the Lord's allowed in my life. And that might stop you to come to church. But that's wrong. Listen, when you're going through difficulties, where you need to be is church. What you need to be doing is praising God and singing the hymns, singing the songs of praises unto the Lord, praising Him continually, you know, with your mouth. Verse number 2, Psalm 34, verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Now, we know we shouldn't boast, all right, because we're nothing. But He does boast. He boasts in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Okay, this is why church is important. So we can magnify the Lord together, exalt his name together. And brethren, this church has to be a church that boasts of the Lord, that magnifies the name of the Lord. Not the name of Pastor Kevin Sepulveda, not the name of some other preacher. The reason this church exists, brethren, is because of God. All right? Why is this church on the Sunshine Coast? Oh, because Pastor Kevin worked hard to move up here and prepared himself to start a church. No, because of God. Okay? God is the one that's allowed this church to exist, and He's allowed me to be a vehicle to help this church exist. He's allowed you to be a vehicle to help this church exist, because we're all part of the same one body. You know? It is because of the Lord, you know, that we can exalt His name together in this church. Not, not only Brother Michael, you know, that obviously, you know, often praising the Lord out of his mouth, but uh, let me just tell you about Pastor Patrick Boyle at the conference. And uh, just a quick story at the uh, conference at Faithful Word Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Boyle and I we were going to team up to go soul. I was actually looking forward to going soul winning with Pastor Boyle, right? And uh, it was a day of the Indian reservation. So we needed, it was like an hour's drive. So, um, we were under the impression that we were going to get picked up or we we're going to be, take a lift with another brother, okay? And this other brother was often on the phone because he was kind of at the conference, but he was working at the same time. So every now and again, he had to step out and he was on a call. And sometimes he'd be on a call for like half an hour or more, okay? Anyway, both he and I, Pastor Boyle and I, were under the impression that this brother was going to give us a lift. And we were both excited. I had the tracks. We knew where we were going to go, right? We had a map. We were going to knock doors. And then our brother that was meant to give us a lift disappeared. And we couldn't find him. And I just said, ah, oh. and we both kind of knew this. We both said, oh, yeah, he's probably taking a call, like, for work, right? So we're just hanging around. We're just waiting for him to come back to, to you know, let us know he's ready to go. And then it's like 10 minutes later, he's not showing up. 20 minutes later, he's not showing up. I'm like, I better go check if he's still out there, you know. Has he forgotten to, right? And I, I go out, I can't find him. About half an hour into this, we're like, He's gone. He's not, like, and we found out later, he, he left. He forgot to get, oh, I don't know if he forgot or there was a miscommunication. And I was kind of like bummed out a bit. I was like, man, I really wanted to go to the Indian Reservation. I really wanted to go soul winning with Pastor Boyle. And the words that came out of his mouth surprised me. Because look, this is something that we know God wants us to do. We know he wants us to go soul winning. I was pumped up for it, right? To do a work for God. But then we couldn't do it. It was too late. It was an hour away. By the time we'll come back, we're going to, you know, uh, mess up the, the conference schedule, things like that. But what he said to me was, well, God just wanted to give us a rest. It wasn't God's plan for us to go soul winning today. Amen. Right? I, I was bummed out. I was like, oh, man. He's like, no, God wanted us to have a rest. God wanted us to just, you know, take time out. You know, that's right. That's acknowledging God. 
that's turning what I thought was a negative into a positive, right? That's me from being, you know, stopping from being frustrated to saying, well, no, let's acknowledge God. And I'm thankful. Went to the hotel, got freshened up, got a shower, ironed my clothes for the next service. Hey, it was time that I needed. We needed a bit of a break and God gave us that break. You know, God can step in and even the things that, you know, you, you intend for good, God may stop you from being able to do that. And instead of getting frustrated, just acknowledge God. Hey, God's made me to stop, you know. And I just think that's a, just a great um, characteristic to have, something that I need to work toward, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not a shame to say, even as a pastor, where I see qualities of, of good, godly men that I need to work toward. Now, maybe I have certain qualities that you say, well, I need to work toward that. Well, I, I look at you guys, and I see you guys as a good example many times, and I need to work toward that, you know. And so we all have a place that we, we all need to work towards something, brethren. We all need to keep uh, growing in the Lord. We need to keep maturing in the Lord. None of us can truly say we made it because we'll never make it until we have those new resurrected bodies, right? Uh, another passage, if you can turn, please, to is uh, go to John chapter 3. Go to John chapter 3. And while you're turning to John chapter 3, I'm going to read to you from Job chapter 2. You go to John 3, and I'll read to you from Job 2. Because we all know the story of Job. We all know this is a man who suffered great loss. He lost his 10 kids. I mean, I've got 10 kids. If I lost my 10 kids, I don't know what would happen. Like, at once. Freak accident, right? Or not even an accident. It was intentional, right? I mean, if you lost your whole family, how would you feel? You know, he lost amazing things, uh, Job. But, and I'm just going to read to you from Job 2 verse 7. It says, So when Satan... So, sorry, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So not only does he lose his family, he loses his great possessions, his, his herds and his, his uh, uh, certain buildings and things. And now he has this great sickness, this, these boils on his flesh from the sole of his foot to his crown. He's full of these boils. Verse number eight, and he took him a pot shed to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. I mean, he's just scraping these boils, right? I mean, it's itchy. He's probably bleeding, all this pus coming off his body, right? I mean, he just looks disgusting. Verse number nine. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And what a harsh, what harsh words. This is what he says in verse number 10. And he said unto her, Thou speakest, as one of the foolish women's, women speaketh. What? Shall we, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Man, Job is able to acknowledge God. He says, man, God has given us so many good things for so long. We receive that. Can't we receive a little bit of evil that God has allowed us to go through? He's able to acknowledge God and say, well, God's allowed me to go through this evil. God's allowing us to go through this hardship. Don't be like a silly woman. You know what I'm saying? Get, get back on the program. Get back and serve God. Get back and acknowledge. Could you say that if you lost your 10 kids? Job was able to do that. What a man of integrity. What a man who's faithful, and yet he's able to acknowledge. God. So many good examples in the Bible of men who suffered more than we'll probably ever suffer. More than we probably have suffered, and they were able to stop and just acknowledge God. Be thankful to God for the good, and he's thankful to God for the evil. Amazing, amazing. Look at John chapter 3, verse 26. You know, even in your personal ambitions, your personal goals in life, there will come a time in your life, brethren, as you mature and you grow in the Lord, where those things that you once craved, the goals that you had once set before you, you you know, your personal desires, they're going to diminish. And it, and it helps diminish those, it, it'll help you diminish those things by acknowledging God. And we see here with John the Baptist in John chapter 3, verse 26. John chapter 3, verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So what's it? Who, who did John bear witness of? That's Jesus Christ. You know, these, these, uh, um, these people are coming up to John saying, look, 
Everybody that was following you is now following Christ. Okay? He's saying, look, your ministry was huge. You had thousands coming to you, but now they've all flocked to someone else. You know, your ministry is on a, on a downhill spiral, is what they're thinking, right? What does, how does John respond? Verse number 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. So look, he acknowledges his ministry. The success came from God. Hey, the fact that now these people have gone to Christ, he's saying, look, this is all coming from heaven. Verse 28. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, increase, but I must decrease. This is what you need to set for your life, brethren. He must increase. Christ must increase, but I must decrease. Listen, when you're a carnal Christian, right, you've got things planned for your life. You've got things you're aiming for, you, things you want to achieve. You're going to find, brethren, as you mature in the Lord, those things are just going to seem like nonsense after a while. You're just going to be, you know, as you acknowledge God, you're going to be able to see the greater truth. You're going to be able to acknowledge eternity rather than the temporary things in this life. The more you acknowledge God, the more you want Him to increase. And as He increases in your life, as His will becomes your will, you're going to be able to be like John the Baptist. What did he say? He says, I rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. You know what's going to give you the most joy in your life? is not when you accomplish your goals. You know, you're going to have great joy in your life when you accomplish the goals that God has for you, the goals of Christ. When you can set Christ, you know, as the priority in your life. And, you know, since becoming a pastor of a church, this has become easier for me. You know, I I set the Lord because I have to. Like, (laughs) there are things, you know, I've got to prepare sermons, right? I'm constantly thinking about this church. I'm constantly thinking about Blessed Old Baptist Church, right? I'm constantly thinking about the brethren constantly praying for their needs, sort of because I'm kind of forced to do it more as a pastor. And I remember, you know, just as a, as a regular church-going person, you know, I had my ambitions and I had the things of God as well. You know, but, you know, as, as, a, as a, you know, when I was just a babe in Christ, you know, I had my goals first and, you know, I'll see where God fits in. But then slowly those priorities would change. Slowly the priorities of God will become my priorities. And, of course, there is great joy when you can accomplish that. But it, it takes you, your acknowledgement to God. And for John the Baptist, he was able to acknowledge Christ and the great work that Christ was able to do. Let's go, to back, to, let's go back to Genesis 45, please. Genesis 45, verse 10. Acknowledge God, brethren, all the days of your life. Acknowledge Him continually with your mouth. Continually give Him praises. Verse number 10, Genesis 45, verse 10. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. So these are the words of Joseph to his brethren, right? And thou shalt be near me, thou and thy children, and thy thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold... Your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen, and ye have haste. Sorry, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. Now, brethren, I want you to think about this this, uh, story here. You know, it's a land of, it's a time of famine, right? They're struggling with getting the food they need. It's only two years in the seven-year period that they've gone through. Joseph says, look, come to the land. Come to Egypt and you can live or you can dwell in the land of Goshen, right? He says, look, it's a place that's fruitful. It's a place that's productive. You can come with your children. You can come with all your herds or the animals you have. And he says, look, that he will provide the needs. He's going to be able to give them food continually for them, okay, during this time of famine. And if you can go to uh, Psalm 37 now. Psalm 37. Again, keep your finger there in Genesis 45. 
but Psalm 37. And parents, I guess I want you to focus in on this passage here in Psalm 37, verse 23. Obviously, Jacob was concerned for his family, for his household, his children. He was concerned for his children's children. He was concerned for his cattle. You know, were they going to starve to death? Were they going to die? But look at verse number 23, Psalm 37, 23. The Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. You know, if you want your steps to be ordered by the Lord, you've got to be a good man. You've got to be a good woman. You've got to be a good child serving the Lord. Look at verse number 24. Though he fall, and we will fall, okay, we're not perfect, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Now, were the children of Israel, was Jacob falling as it were? Yeah, to some extent, right? They were, they were without food, right? But were they utterly cast down? Were they going to die from hunger? No, the Lord will uphold him. Look at verse 25. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Brethren, a great promise of God, if we're saved, if we seek to, learn, to live righteously for God, for, for God, it says that your seed will not be begging for bread, that you will not be forsaken. And brethren, I know as, as parents, one of our greatest concerns, one of the greatest things that's on your mind is, can I provide for the family? Are we going to have enough? Is this job going to provide our needs? Are my children going to suffer? Are my children going to go hungry? We have a promise here of God that your children will never go hungry. You know, if you're saved, you're serving the Lord righteously. He's going to provide uh, bread for your seed. You're never going to have to beg for bread. You're never going to have that hunger, you know, and, and, and be concerned for your children. You know, I'm, I'm also teaching through the end times. And the end times is going to be tribulation. There's going to be a shortage of food, right? But what's the promise here? Your seed will never beg for bread. God's going to provide our needs. All we need to do is live righteously for God. And look, did it seem difficult for Jacob? Absolutely. They didn't have food on their land of, in the land of Canaan. They had to go to Egypt. But God had set things in motion that they would not starve. All right? God had set things in motion that they would have the food, that they would be taken care of. Look at verse number 26 in Psalm 37. It says here, speaking of the righteous, speaking of the saints, he is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Man, if there's a shortage of food, don't you, I mean, your, your natural thought would be, I need to keep this for myself. What does the righteous do? He is ever merciful and lendeth. He gives of himself. And this is why we don't need to be afraid to lend. We don't have to be afraid to give to others, because God's going to make sure that our seed is blessed. He's going to make sure that we're provided for. You say, well, then I can just quit job. I can just quit my job and God's going to provide for me. That's not being righteous. You quit your job and think, oh, well, God's going to take care of it. That's not being righteous. God wants you to go to work. That's part of his commandments to you, to provide for those that are under you, okay? To be a hard worker, to provide for your family. If you do what God's asked you to do, you get a job, you work hard, he's going to make sure he provides your needs. You're going to make sure he provides for your family, for your children, and for your children's children, right? He's going to uh, do that for you. But you need to do the righteous thing. You need to go out there, get a job, provide for yourself. Go back to Genesis 45, verse 14. Genesis 45, verse 14. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them, and after that his brethren talked with him. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, lay your beasts, and go get you unto the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat of the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. 
also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. So Pharaoh, he's so happy with Joseph, right? He says, look, just bring your family. Look, just take these wagons, right? Verse number 19, out of the land of Egypt for your little ones. If you don't have the necessary resources, you don't have the, the modes of transport, take the wagons, take the, take the cars, right? Take the van, take whatever you need, right? So, so the little ones, the children, so the women don't have to, uh, you know, labor hard in their journey to Egypt. Let them ride in comfort is what he's saying, right? And so he's very generous to, to Joseph and his family. Oh, I like this Pharaoh, all right? I like this Pharaoh. He's good to, to God's people here. And it's interesting what he says in verse number 20 also. He says, also regard not your stuff. He says, look, if you can't take all your things, all your stuff, don't worry about it. Don't, don't, don't regard it. Just, just let it go. If you can't take everything with you, he says, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. It's going to be better for you over here. Whatever, whatever you, you can't take with you, you're going to have more of it in the land of Egypt, okay? And uh, I'll just read a portion of scripture to you here in 2 Corinthians 4.17. It reminds me of this. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Brethren, you know what the Bible says here? Your hardship, your affliction is a light affliction. No, 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 it's very heavy. No, it's light in comparison to the glory, the eternal weight of glory in heaven that's awaiting you, all right? And this is like what Pharaoh says, regard not your stuff. Don't worry about your afflictions. It's, it's, it's so small in comparison to the glory you're going to get in eternity. Now, what a truth to live by. It's hard. It is hard. And then it says in verse number 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the, thing, for, uh, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What does God want us to think about? What, what does God want, to, want us to see, set our sights on? The eternal, the glories of heaven. Don't regard your stuff on this earth, brethren. You know, don't be someone that's laying up your treasures on this earth. You know, do what God asks you to do. Yeah, work hard. The Lord will bless you on this earth. God will give you many things. As Australians, you probably heard my sermon at Faithful Word, we're rich. We're like the richest people in this world, all right, per adults. You know, God's given us amazing riches on this earth already, but God does not want us to regard our stuff here on this earth, the temple things, okay? They're here to get us through life, but they're here to help us serve God and be focused on eternity. You know, use your riches, use your possessions to serve God, not to serve yourself. Use it to serve God. Have your sight set on eternal matters genesis 45 verse 21 genesis 45 verse 20, 21 and the children of israel did so and joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of pharaoh and gave them provision for the way to all of them he gave each man changes of raiment but to benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. so joseph is given his brothers all this stuff the wagons, right? The transportation. He gives them a change of clothes. He gives them, especially Benjamin, 500 pieces of silver, all right? He's given them money, clothing, and transportation, all right? And here's, here's, what, here's what you need to understand, brethren. To get to heaven, all right? We live on this earth. We're traveling through. You know, we're sojourners on this land. Our destination is the new heavens and the new earth. You know, the new Jerusalem, God's going to give you every provision you need to get there in life, okay? Now, of course, that first provision is Jesus Christ, okay? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But then we're living on this earth as well, okay? We're going through the hardships of life. We're going through the struggles of life. We're going through the struggles of sin. We're going through the struggles maybe financially, maybe the struggles with relationships, whatever it is. Maybe you're lacking faith in the Lord, but God promises to give you everything you need to make that journey smooth, to make it easy. What did Jesus say? He says, my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you, right? He says, and learn of me. You know, Jesus does not ask a lot from you. He gives you the power of God. This is why we have to walk in the Spirit. You know, if we're not in the Spirit, if we're not relying upon the strength of God, yes, life is difficult. But when you're in the Spirit, when you have the power of God at your disposal, God makes it light. God makes it easy. In fact, it's His power that's getting you through life, brethren. 
You know, if life is difficult for you today, you're not using the Spirit of God. You're not using the power of God. You know, we need to tap into that power. He gives us the change of raiment. He gives us the finances. He gives us the mode of transportation so we can be focused on the travel to heaven. And uh, look at verse number 23. And to his father he sent after this manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt and ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father, by the way. So food as well he's given him. And so he sent his brethren away, so they're going back to the land of Canaan, right? And they departed, and he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. He says, don't give up. You know, make sure you go all the way, and you come all the way back. You know, you accomplish the goal, you accomplish the mission, is what Joseph says. Don't be afraid. Just do what I've asked. You've got everything at your disposal. Don't stop. Don't fall out of the way. And brethren, Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And if you want to reap the blessings of God, don't faint. Keep going. Even when you're tempted to faint, even when you're tempted to give up serving the Lord, don't faint. Don't get weary in well-doing. Just complete the journey. Be faithful to the journey that God has asked us to do. Verse 25, And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. So they're telling their father, brothers, get back. He says, look, Joseph's alive. He says he, the father, believed them not. He doesn't believe him. Why? Because he believed he died. Right? He believed... As far as Jacob is concerned or Israel is concerned, Joseph is dead. He's mourned the death. He's accepted the death of Joseph, right? And he's hearing about him being alive. He says, for he believed them not. All right. Now, as we finish this chapter, I want you to think about someone else that died and was alive, is yet alive, right? That's, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, brethren? And I just want to finish up on soul winning here because... We're going, right? We're going to people. We're telling them about the Savior who died, Jesus Christ. But what I need you to focus on when you give the gospel is not just focus on the death, but also focus on His resurrection. Focus that Jesus Christ is alive. Now, obviously, when we give the gospel, what is the gospel? It's a death. It is a burial. It is a resurrection. It is the fact that Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead. And the Bible says, and if Christ... Be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. It's important for you to acknowledge the resurrection of Christ, that He is alive. And uh, if they're not convinced at His resurrection, that He's alive, then He's going to be like Jacob. Believe not. They're not going to believe the, the, you know, the gospel message. All right? Now, sometimes, you know, obviously I'm giving the gospel to people. Maybe you've all experienced this, those that go dulce or soul when you... And I say to them, you know, once we finish the gospel presentation, I, I summarize it, you know, so would you admit you're a sinner? Yes, according to the Bible, where do sinners go without Christ or to hell? All right, but does God want us to go to hell? No. And then I'll get to this question. So what did God do so we didn't have to go to hell? Oh, he died on the cross or he sent Jesus, to die, something like that, right? He died on the, on the cross for our sins. And that, that's usually, I mean, I would say the vast majority of the time, that's where they'll end. He died on the cross for my sins. And then I'm like, and? How long was he dead for? Oh, yeah, three days. And then, oh, yeah, he rose again from the dead. Amen. That's the gospel. Now you're getting it, right? You've got to acknowledge the resurrection. That's so important, okay? Without the resurrection, your faith is in vain. Now, how do they convince him, though? When you look at Jacob, he doesn't believe. They told him, no, he's alive. He doesn't believe. What convinces him? Let's keep going. Verse number 27. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he said unto them, and when he, that's when Jacob saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. So what convinced Israel that Joseph was alive? It's, it's, it's basically the evidence of his, that he's alive, right? All the things that Joseph had given them, right? All that evidence, the wagons, the food, the money, the clothing, 
Look, Joseph is alive. Look what he's given us. And he looks at the evidence. Yep, it is enough. He believes now that Jesus Christ is alive. Brethren, what is the evidence of, that we need to give of Jesus Christ? Did you witness the resurrection of Christ? Can you go and knock on someone's door and say, listen, I'm telling you, I saw Christ resurrected 2,000 years ago. I mean, you can't say that. Now, that is one witness that Jesus Christ used. That is one sure evidence that Christ used in the first century, right? These people that uh, saw the resurrected Christ. But for us, brethren, you know, 2 Peter 1.19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What's the sure word of prophecy? This book, once again. This is the evidence of Christ's resurrection, of His sacrifice, of coming back to life. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Brethren, as soul winners, use this book as much as you can. This is the evidence of Christ's resurrection. This is what's going to cause people to believe that Christ not only died, but that He rose again from the dead, that He is alive. Brethren, you know, as, uh, you know if, if you're someone that's not used to soul winning, maybe you're going out for the first time, stop relying on you convincing people just from your own words. Go to the Word of God. Use the Word of God. Memorize the Scriptures. All right? Memorize the Gospel presentation as far as the Scriptures go. That's what's going to cause people to believe. Okay? And if you're finding that you're struggling to see people believe on Christ, you probably need more scripture, okay? You probably need to rely less on what you, you know, can uh, argue and more on the Word of God. This is the evidence of the resurrected Christ. And so, those are some of the parallels there that we see in Genesis 45. But what I want to end with, just once again, brethren, acknowledge God. You know, get into the habit every day of your life. Ask yourself a question tomorrow before you go to bed. Have I acknowledged God today? Say, man, no, I'm not really. Then you need to work on it. Right? And say, well, I didn't really do very well on Monday. So Tuesday, I'm going to acknowledge God. Wednesday, I'm going to acknowledge God. It's not just church on, on Sundays. It's not just church on, on Wednesday evenings. You need to learn to acknowledge God all the days of your life. Let's pray.